Hello, Professor Wong Cole. Thank you so much for joining me on exploring the Quran and the Bible. Well, thanks for having me, Gabriel. I think it's it's probably too late. I should have done this much earlier, but uh, viewers of this channel will be really, really glad that finally uh, we're having a chat about your work uh, on the Quran, also the historical context of the Quran, the relationship between late antiquity and the Quran. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions about your 2018 book, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace. Uh, but then we're going to turn, you've published, you've been extremely productive, so we'll be turning to two of your articles. One about uh, the important question of what does the uh, the verb kafira and the noun kuf, often translated as to disbelieve and disbeliever, what do they actually mean? And then uh, a very uh, intriguing topic uh, about the, the punishment for fornication or adultery in the Quran in the late of, in, sorry, in the light of uh, late antiquity. Um, both Judaism and Christianity. So uh, that's what's on tap, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction. Uh, so everyone, um, probably Awan Kohn needs no introduction. I'll just add a few lines. He is Richard P. Mitchell, Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. Uh, for many years now, he has sought to put the relationship of the West and the Muslim world in historical context. His 2018 book is Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires, uh, already mentioned briefly. He's the author of many other books and articles, including The New Arabs, How the Millennial Generation is Changing the Middle East, Engaging the Muslim World, Napoleon's Egypt Invading the Middle East, uh, to mention just a few. Is there something else I should add, Juan? What, yeah, anything missing there? That, that's fine. They can look it up if they want Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, also, um, I mean, Juan, in addition to his academic work, is an import, important commentator and observer of, uh, of uh, politics and society, including, but not only, in the Middle East. So, I, yeah, Juan, if it's okay, even though it's a 2018 book, let's turn briefly to Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires. Uh, I think the title matters, including the second part of it. So why do you put Muhammad, Prophet of Peace specifically in the context of Clash of Empires? Well, you know, I'm following uh, the great classicist Glenn Bowersock, who uh, contextualized uh, the early years of uh, Muhammad's preaching uh, in the war that was fought between the Sasanian Empire and the late Roman Empire uh, between 603 and roughly 630. Right. Uh, which, um, oddly enough, uh, before Bowersock, there had been very little attention to this possible context for uh, very early, what we now call Islam. Uh, and um, I, the, the genesis of this book really was in uh, my uh, role as a public intellectual. Uh, you know, there was a rise of very virulent Islamophobia right. uh, after 9-11. There was also a rise of extremism in, in some of the Muslim communities. And um, I, as somebody who had been studying Islam uh, academically since the 1970s, was disturbed by what I saw as the distortions of the historical record. So I, I wanted to go back and write about uh, the Quran and uh, of course, there are many verses in the Quran that are about reconciliation. It's it's not all. In fact, verses about war are relatively few. Right. Uh, and um, I tried to investigate those, and I actually got pushback from my readers at the blog that they didn't believe that these verses were in the Quran. Uh, that you should do good to people who do evil to you, and so forth. And uh, so I thought I had to write a book. I didn't want it. I wanted to write a, general, a book for a general audience. I didn't want it to be a tome uh, on, uh, on the university library. And um, so I, I went to my agent with the idea, and uh, she was enthusiastic. And the editor that I ended up uh, working with insisted that I take a biographical approach uh, because that's what the general audience would want. They would want to hang this material on, on, a, on a biography. And I, I thought, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? Because the entire thrust of academic scholarship for the past 30 years has been to argue that 
there can be no biography of the Prophet. The, the sources are all late. Uh, How can you the, capture the, the Muhammad of history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the dating of the Quran is, is unknown. And uh, from a historian's point of view, this is a, 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 a daunting task. Yes. But um, in the meantime, you know, the findings about the uh, the Sana palimpsest, which you've written about, uh, which uh, I think, you know, carbon dating isn't exact, but the idea that the Quran was, was eighth or ninth century is, is I think, over with. Uh, I agree. I, I agree. We can agree that it's a document from the first half of the, of the seventh century. Uh, and so I felt comfortable in trying to use the Quran to write the biography of the mm -hmm. Prophet. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, it, it's notorious for not having very much information about the Prophet in it, uh, but of course, attitudes are there. And uh, and then um, I admitted a very small number of, of uh, later reports, especially uh, Orwe ibn al-Zubair, uh, that uh, uh, Schirler has, I think, shown to be fairly early. Uh, and then I wanted to contextualize it in the Sasanian and in the, in the Roman Empire. Right. And uh, so, you know, the, the verses in the Quran about apocalyptic uh, happenings coming, uh, the stars falling out of the sky, and, and, and those things are tropes that we find in Syriac and, and, and earlier Christian literature as well. But uh, I think they also are responding to the anxieties uh, that were being produced, uh, and these are visible in other contemporary documents in the early uh, 7th century by the Sasanian invasion of the Near East, which was, it wasn't unprecedented for the Sasanians to strike into the Near East, it was unprecedented for them to conquer it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iranians hadn't ruled Egypt, I think, since, since Darius in the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I think it was a significant geopolitical shift. And, and the people responded in, in the era uh, by turning to apocalyptic thinking. So some of the Quran's uh, more apocalyptic verses in the Meccan period, I, I think, are responses to that war. Mm -hmm. So a cataclysmic uh, and, event, uh, not so far away. Yeah, well, would, uh, I would argue not far away at all, because... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's often forgotten the Sasanians had Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were right on the doorstep. Of, right. and, and then I argue they, uh, even before they took Jerusalem, they took Petra, with which it seems clear to me the, the, the Meccan community had some kind of relationship uh, of trade uh, and uh, and travel. So, uh, yes, I, I, I think the Hejaz didn't suffer direct invasion by the Sasanians, but that the Sasanians were coming was clear all around it. Uh, and so there were anxieties. Um, and I think you know, some of what's in the Quran uh, about, for instance, paradise uh, is, is actually an attempt to set out a counter reality, a, a, an ideal society uh, that uh, is 180 degrees from what was actually going on in the world, which was mass slaughter. I mean, the, the Sasanians were ruthless. Right, and, right. So the blessed in paradise hear the word peace, peace in the Quran. Yes. Right? Yeah. When you get to heaven, uh, if you're if you're chosen to go there, you get to heaven, the, the angel grace greets you with peace. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in heaven, you trade blessings of peace with the other inhabitants. Uh, and then in one verse, it seems that you know, the blessings of heaven are kind of laid out hierarchically, and there's uh, all, all the, the nice food you could have and uh, 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 pleasant uh, surroundings and so forth. But the, the pin pinnacle of paradise is when God, the voice of God, yes. wishes you peace. Yes. Uh, and uh, the Quran says that in paradise, uh, people put away their grudges. There's no vendettas, there's no feuding, there's, there's no, feuding, there's no hard feelings. Uh, and um, so I don't think this is just a description of a future paradise. I think it's also an expression of a hope for how 
human society mm-hmm. could be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, and, and the, the biggest cluster of, of roots having to do with peace in the Quran occurred there in the in the Meccan surahs when, when talking about paradise. But then um, uh, it's clear that the early believers around Muhammad uh, valued uh, humility and self-effacement and a, and a, an ability to wish well to one's enemies. Yes. So uh, those who walk humbly upon the earth, the, the, the servants of the unmerciful, uh, when the jahalum, which you know it, it literally means the, lit- the 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 ignorant, but in that period, it, it meant the people lacking self control, hmm. rowdy people, mm-hmm. uh, say, um, ruffians. Uh, when when those people accost you, you 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 say peace, mm-hmm. you wish peace back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a kind and of how do you counter? Sorry to jump in, but I mean, how do you counter the classical, maybe uh, associated with different Orientalist idea that, well, fair enough, uh, the, the Muslims in Mecca were peaceful because they were under persecution and they had no way to fight back. But as soon as they found that way uh, in Medina, uh, then all of the things that they disliked about their persecutors and oppression o- oppressors. Uh, they themselves adopted and carried out against unbelievers and in, in, in the Medinan period. Well, obviously, uh, the the uh, Meccan period was one uh, where I, I don't think it's it's just a matter of uh, them being small and helpless. I think it was an ethos, mm-hmm. uh, and I think you know it comes out of Arabian uh, custom. We know enough about the archaeology to know that the ancient Arabs uh, put aside feuding at uh, sanctuaries and shrines to the right. divine. Right. So there, there were uh, what's, what's called a haram, uh, was a place where you, you couldn't pursue a vendetta. Uh, and then there were also nature preserves, hamat, where you couldn't cut down trees and uh, or, or, or hunt gazelles and so forth. I think Mecca was both. It was a hamat and it was a, a, a haram. And uh, the Banu Hashim, uh, um, for what it's worth, uh, depicted in the later sources as the custodians of the, of the uh, Kaaba, and uh, individuals like Abu Talib are depicted as having a role in keeping the peace, uh, the, in, mm-hmm. in, in mediating, and so forth. So I think Muhammad came out of a milieu uh, of, of of conciliation and, and, and peacemaking, uh, and that that's reflected in the uh, Mecca uh, surahs, uh, and which Orientalist scholarship has almost completely ignored. Mm-hmm. These verses that I'm concentrating on, mm-hmm. have, to my knowledge, just haven't been discussed uh, mm-hmm. taken seriously. Now, after the move to Medina, uh, what the Quran seems to indicate uh, is that the pagans in Medina, in, in Mecca, uh, came after the Muslims. Uh, that, that they launched raids up to, towards Medina. Uh, and um, I interpret the belligerent verses in the Quran as, as about self defense. Mm-hmm. And I am. Um, I say this, you know, for many reasons, but one of them is that uh, there's a verse in Surah Al-Anfal in this, the, the chapter of the spoils, which we think is is uh, what I ate. Yes. you know having to do with the, uh, the, the battle of, of, of Badr and uh, an, an early Medinan period. It, it says that if if the enemy sues for peace, you have to accept it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not an ethos that you would hold if you were a believer in aggressive warfare, mm-hmm. because you would be attacking these towns. Wouldn't they always sue for peace? Mm-hmm. If, if you had to accept the suit for peace, mm-hmm. then you could never actually conquer anything. Mm-hmm. The only, the only, you know, community out of which such a statement would come would be a community that was pursuing defensive warfare. So obviously, if if you're defending and the aggressor sues for peace, then you would, you would accept it. 
So, I mean, this this raises uh, Professor Cole the question of how to square this reading of the Quran with some of the early historical literature, uh, the what people sometimes call the Maghazi literature, which I mean is is a phrase which refers to works which speak about more than the so-called raids or Maghazi. But when they do speak about the raids of the Prophet or the the Muslim community at the time of the Prophet. Uh, they don't. They don't always speak about them in the way that uh, your interpretation of the Quran suggests was Muhammad's own um, uh, attitude or disposition towards war and peace. They they celebrate his victories. Uh, they they enumerate the number of times Muhammad sent people out. You know, not some an occasion not instigated by the opponent, but you know he went out on raids uh, against those who uh, were were unbelievers, and we'll speak about that term. When it comes, I mean, to give one example, after Hudaybiyah, he makes peace according to the traditional historical account with the Meccans, but then very quickly sends out a raid to Khaybar, uh, where the sort of refugees of the Medinan Jews have settled and conquers there and slaves are taken and they're defeated. So uh, do, how do you approach that sort of literature which celebrates uh, the military prowess of the earliest Muslim community? Well, John Wansbrew made this point uh, in one of his studies of the Quran that the, that literature produced in the late Umayyad and, uh, and in the Abbasid period about the Prophet uh, deployed the tropes of pre-Islamic uh, Arabic poetry, which celebrates warfare mm -hmm. uh, in, in regard to the Prophet. And I think by the time that these people were writing these uh, accounts, um, you know, the, the Muslim empires were at war with the Byzantines. It was a martial uh, atmosphere. Uh, and uh, the prophet was interpreted as a martial figure. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I see Christians doing this to Christ uh, and Mary uh, in the late antique period. So Sophronius talks about Christ almost as if he's Mars, you know, as if he's the Roman god of war. Uh, wishes that Christ would come down and take care of these Persians. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a uh, an author who was trapped in in Constantinople by the Iranian siege, uh, who um, who talks about people having witnessed a vision of the Mother Mary defending her chapel from the Iranians and and cutting the tendons of the Persian soldiers. So. Okay. Um, reimagining like your holy figures as, as sorry as, to jump as, in i'm just going to say it sounds yeah. like the accounts of the angels at Badr at the yes. yeah yeah well and there are account in uh, there's um uh, uh theophylactus has a, a a chronicle of the of an earlier roman persian battle in which he talks about uh, the angels coming and, and helping and, and giving rewards to the Roman, so Roman Christian soldiers and so forth. That is very much like this in the Quran. So, and then, you know, if you read the, the, the church fathers, which you know much better than I do, but uh, St. Ambrose and Augustine, um, none of them disputed that warfare was legitimate. Legitimate, right. Uh, and they did, however, want it to be just. Mm -hmm. And so you have the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic tradition of just war thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so here's my thesis, which is that if we read the Quran carefully and uh, sort of set aside the later material for the moment, okay. Okay. it sounds an awful lot like the church fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, it presents a just war theory. Mm -hmm. of war that i actually think it was somebody who who you know is is, is steeped in this literature and who knows augustine in, in the uh, in the latin and so forth could write a very interesting comparison of, of augustine's just war theory and the quran mm -hmm. for instance they you know because augustine is interesting because so much of his correspondence survives it for an, an, an late antique figure is it's, it's, it's a tremendous corpus so we know a lot about what he thought if someone asked him is it all right to um ambush people in war okay play a trick on them because you you can imagine an ethical position that no you know you have to 
face them like men and, and so forth. And Augustine said, yes, if it helps the war effort, by all means, ambush them. And you know, there's a similar verse in the Quran. Yes. Uh, so I think if we read those uh, those verses about war, which again, are a tiny part of the corpus and I think a tiny part of the Muslim experience, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a late antique context and in a, a late antique Christian context in particular, we don't look out of, out of, uh, out of um, the ordinary at all. And, uh, and there's no evidence in the Quran for the later Muslim, uh, uh, late, late Umayyad and Abbasid approach to, the, to, the, to this period. Mm -hmm. There's not a single mention, as far as I can tell, of raiding caravans in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it, it's just not, nothing like that is mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few mentions of some skirmishes and some some battles. There aren't very many of them. Right, right. Um, and uh, either the Quran didn't bother to talk about most of what was going on, or a lot of those raids were, were later inventions. And, and I'll point out to you that even in uh, some of the Syria literature that, uh, that structures the life of the prophet around these raids, uh, typically the first six that are mentioned don't involve any fighting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're clearly just expeditions to the countryside in search of Bedouin allies. Right. But they have been characterized by Alakadi as raids. So there, there seemed to have been a mindset, a, an episteme that needed to impose this martial framework on the prophets. And as biography. You, maybe not the so, first occurrence yeah. of that uh, imposition. I'm sorry? Well, uh, as yeah. you suggest, maybe not the first occurrence. Maybe this is uh, a process that unfolds uh, with religious groups when they meet political social realities. And, yeah. Well, if, if it's okay, Professor Cole, maybe we'll turn to the question of unbelief, which is not unrelated, in part because sometimes war is said in the context of believers versus unbelievers, but also because your article on the question of kefara is, uh, takes up uh, uh, the question of the late antique context of early Islam, which will be a theme of our discussion, I think, throughout um, today. Uh, including in the following article as well. Um, so this is an article, friends, that were that was published in a JAOS, a Journal of the American Oriental Society, entitled Infidel or Paganos, the Polysemy of Kafira in the Quran. I think it may be available on your academia page. Is that right? Uh, it's uh, actually available at my academia page, but it's also uh, uh, free to download from the uh, uh, the JAOS. It, it, okay. They don't, they don't copyright things. So. Terrific, terrific. Yes. So um, maybe we'll just start with sort of the background to this project, uh, and uh, people will remember that uh, the Arabic, even if you don't study or know Arabic, that the Arabic word kuf is commonly interpreted as something like unbelief. And uh, therefore, um, that's the noun. And therefore, someone using is someone who is a kafir, guilty of kuf, is often translated. Uh, that term is often translated kafir as unbeliever, or and this sounds even worse. At least I think in contemporary English, an infidel. And then correspondingly, people would say, oh, in the verb kafara means to disbelieve, maybe to misbelieve, usually to disbelieve. And this is this these words have become at least kafir, kufr as well. They've become almost English words. I mean, I see them on my Twitter or X all the time. Sometimes from Muslims who will say things like, oh, this kafir said that, or so such and such. Or and sometimes from non-Muslims who will sort of embrace being a kafir and saying, Yeah, I'm a kafir. I've heard one of our colleagues described by Muslims. Uh, as the friendly kafir. So that's another kind of use of it, uh, because this is someone who's known for being sympathetic to the sympathies, or rather the um, the sentiments of Muslims. Um, so, okay, uh, you contend with all of these definitions uh, uh, surrounding kafir, kuf, and kafira. Uh, how did you start thinking about this question? Why did you write an article on kuf? Well, Gabriel, I've, uh, uh, being a historian, um, I I don't approach words as as abstract entities. I I always want to see them right. 
in their historical context. Right. And of course, they change in their meanings over time. Um, and uh, uh, so I wanted to think about what the late antique equivalent of al kafirun would be. Of, right. of the, that being the plural, or one of the plural forms for kafir, kafirun. The plural form of the progressive participle or the deverbal noun. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, and it, it seemed to me that uh, if you thought about it, in, in Greek, it, I think it would be, uh, the kufr would be asabia, uh, a, a lack of proper awe towards towards God. Hmm. And uh, in, can, in can Latin, you say that Greek word again, first of all? Asab, asabia. Okay, okay. So, um, and uh, the the Latin, it seemed to me, al Catherine were the, the pagans, with paganos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and um, uh, and then I, I really started thinking that there's something to this. Uh, so here's the thing. When we talk about these words, let's be linguists for a second. Okay. Because uh, linguists have categories for words, which are very useful in analyzing them. Linguists make a distinction between verbs and nouns. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of us don't. We think if, if a verb means something and there's a deverbal noun from it, therefore it means the same thing. But linguists are aware that the deverbal nouns actually evolve often away from their meaning of the verb. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ways that can happen is if people are bilingual uh, and there's an, another similar noun in the other language they know, and so it gets assimilated, mm -hmm. uh, which is called a loan shift. Um, so um, uh, I am arguing that, first of all, there are two verbs at stake here. There's kafara, uh, which is not a transitive verb. It doesn't take an object. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's kafara b. Kafara b with the preposition. With the preposition, mm -hmm. which, uh, of course, the preposition does take a, 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 an object. Right. Um, kafara b always means to reject. Okay. Okay. Kafara only sometimes means that. Mm -hmm. And I would say maybe even rarely. Okay. I if you look at the words that are around the verb kaf kafara in the Quran, there are things like rebellion, disrespect, mm -hmm. uh, uh, blast. I, I would argue blasphemy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so forth. That it has a wide range of meanings, and, and linguists mm -hmm. call this polysemy when when a word can mean lots of different things. So I'm arguing that. People have misunderstood kafara to be the same as kafara b. That they have misunderstood. This is called a um, a, a, a phrasal verb when you have a a preposition with it that helps to determine its mm -hmm. its meaning, and it's it's the idiosyncratic phrasal verb, which we have a lot of in English. Like uh, I, um, I think you use the example uh, to get up as opposed yes. to. Get. I, I get a I get myself a sandwich, but I get up in the morning. Right. right. The, the the preposition makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, people have been reading kafara as though it's kafara b. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mistake. And and if if you look at all the ways ways the Quran uses kafara, it, it doesn't always mean to reject. Yeah. To me, this is a really intriguing bit. It's, it might seem at first as though it's a small observation, but actually it's consequential, uh, especially when you take into account your argument that paganus is related here and maybe you could just introduce us a, a bit to the the breadth or the semantic range of the latin term paganos yeah well you know there are lots of theories about how it developed uh, but it, its initial connotation seems to have been rural people or people who are outside the center of the city country, country bumpkins country bumpkins uh, <laughs> and um and that went on being one of its one of its contextual meetings uh, for a long time. And they, they the, the Christians used to make fun of the Roman aristocracy who remained pagans, that they were 
country bump bumpkins in a way, even though they thought of themselves as sophisticated city people because of their pagan beliefs, they, they were joined with the, with the rural uh, uh, villagers. Um, but then it, it because I think city people adopted Christianity earlier uh, and uh, at a greater rate than the rural areas, uh, it, it came to have a connotation also of believing in the old gods. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it had both, both meanings. And here's the thing. There's a verse in the Quran that says when the rains come and things turn green, the kufar get happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're rural folk. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're peasantry. And I hopefully I'm not going too quickly here, so you can uh, slow me down or add another point. But I, I it now this seems like a good time to to note the argument you make that the kafirun, the Quranic kafirun, that is the the that if you permit me, the unbelievers in the Quranic context, or maybe better, the opponents of the believing community in the Quran. You speak of them uh, not not simply as Meccan polytheists connected to the, uh, I don't know, the, the historical idolatry that was distinctive to the city of Mecca, but as, quote, a provincial survival of greco nebatean religion. So mm -hmm. I mean, uh, could you explain that a bit? Is this a way of, of emphasizing the connection between classical pagans and the kafirun in the Quran? Well, of course, it's a little bit speculative, but uh, I think there were lots of different kinds of what we would now call pagans in the Hejaz, mm -hmm. as there were still in the uh, uh, Levant, um, uh, which uh, John of Ephesus talks about even as late as the 560s, 570s, there were still pagans in the Levant. Uh, and, and so the different kinds. I think there's a difference between the, the um, pastoralist or Bedouin pagans uh, and the urban ones. And, and the urban ones, from, from what the Quran says, I think, the urban ones uh, had a genealogy in Nabataean religion. Uh, the um, archaeology also seems to support this. So the Nabataeans who ruled a kingdom that included both what we would now call Jordan and the Northern Hejaz, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, their religious beliefs have been excavated by scholars like Healy. Uh, and uh, those goddesses mentioned in the Quran, uh, Alat, uh, and uh, the great goddess, and uh, al Oza and uh, Manat, mm -hmm. uh, all of those are are mentioned in the Nabataean inscriptions. Mm -hmm. They aren't mentioned together. Right, right. And then in the Quran, it's at least implied that people thought that they were the daughters of Allah, the daughters of mm. the great God. Uh, again, there's nothing like that in the inscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, th there is one inscription that uh, Ahmed of Jalad, the great epigraphist uh, and, and archaeologist, has found that. Uh, depicts a lot as the daughter of the star god Rodal, mm -hmm. uh, but um, not of Allah. So we know that in, in uh, pre-literate pagan societies, these mythical uh, relationships can change, and sometimes quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the, the Nabataeans were conquered by the Romans in 106, and the uh, Eastern Roman Empire was ruled in Greek. Uh, and so, uh, and, and people, I think there's some evidence of Greeks still being an urban standard in the Levant among many people. Mm -hmm. So these Nabataean deities were associated with Greek counterparts from Mount Olympus. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, a lot was uh, associated, I think, quite frequently with Athena. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, uh, Aloza was associated with Aphrodite, and you find some mentions of this in some of the church fathers and the Stylites. Uh, and uh, Manat was identified with uh, uh, Tiche or, or Fortuna, or the goddess of, uh, of, of fortune uh, and chance. So these were not absolute identifications. They shifted. Sometimes mm -hmm. the goddesses were, were paired in different ways. But 
on the whole, that was the way it was. Now, I mean, it just, again, it's a little speculative, but um, Athena uh, was the daughter of Zeus, merged from his brain. Uh, and uh, so it seems to me that it could be we're looking at Hellenistic Greek or Hellenic, I mean to say, a Greek influence on the evolution of, of Nabataean belief. Mm -hmm. And the archaeologist and, and, and epigrapher um, um, Leila Nehme yes. uh, has been doing work in uh, the Hijra area, uh, right. Dan Saltland and so forth. And she has a very recent article in which she says that she, she, stop, she stops finding mention of many of the uh, Nabataean gods in the fourth, fifth centuries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except for these four. Okay. She keeps finding mentions of Allah and Allah and Aluza and, uh, and, and Manat. And Manat, interesting. Okay. She's very interesting. Yes. Because yes. this is just north of the place where, where, where Muhammad was, and those are exactly the four that still show up in the Quran. Mm -hmm. So it seems as though people who worshipped according to the Nabataean way and the Hejaz, uh, you know, with this genealogy and, and Nabataean religion, probably more urban people, uh, uh, had a narrowing of their, of their pantheon. pantheon. That's yes. right. and, well, and then by the time you get to the, to the 6th century, the 500s, archaeologists aren't finding any inscriptions to anyone but Allah. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so, Ahmed Jalad on this channel has spoken about, yeah, uh, about a, a sort of revolution before the revolution of Islam, right, uh, which is right. the disappearance of the polytheistic inscriptions and and the the paleo the appearance of the paleo Arabic monotheistic inscriptions. So Patricia Krohn suggested that the background of Quranic uh, paganism was to some extent henotheistic, the idea mm -hmm. that that there was a, a great god which, with lesser deities below him, um, maybe even angels. Uh, and um, I, I, I have a little bit of a dispute with, uh, uh, with the late uh, uh, Patricia, but uh, on the whole, I think she's probably mm -hmm. about right about this and that the archaeology is mm -hmm. supporting some of that. So that's what I meant. The, well, the Quran I, is, is, yes. is, uh, is saying to the Kafir room, you worship what you worship, but you're not worshiping the same thing as I'm worshiping. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in Surat al-Kafirun. In, in, in Surat al-Najm. Oh, in Surat al-Kafirun. I mean to say, it, it, what I'm saying is a reference to the Surat al-Najm uh, depiction yeah. of these people as still having these lesser deities, uh, the goddesses that they insist on mm -hmm. uh, worshiping alongside God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's only one of the strains of paganism that were there. I think the pagans probably had a very different way of approaching things and different gods. So the Quran at one point says, you know, don't bow down to the sun and the moon. Uh, uh, we know that there were sun and moon goddesses that were mm -hmm. worshiped in the, in the jazz. Maybe the Bedouin were still worshiping them. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's what I meant by that. I, I think not only do, can we say that al kafirun as a term, uh, probably is best translated as pagans. Uh, but then there are different kinds of Kafirun. Yes. Uh, and, and yes. Maybe maybe the Mushrikun, who's, which is another word, is associating uh, deities with God. Yes. Um, I, I toy with the idea that maybe they're the Bedouins uh, who have a, a bigger pantheon uh, and okay. for whom gods are more interchangeable. But okay. in any case, uh, one of my arguments is that the noun al kafirun uh, always and only refers to pagans. Uh, that there's now, let no... me just mention, can I jump in here, uh, Professor Cole, just to mention an argument that I found very convincing about the larger question of what a kafir is, uh, is when you refer to the description of the devil as min al-kafirin, so one of the kafirun. Uh, and you, you rightly, uh, in my opinion, point out that the devil in no way is a polytheist, uh, recognizes the sovereignty of God, of course, according to the different accounts, when he is uh, set out of the Quranic paradise, uh, a sort of pact or arrangement, he, he makes a sort of pact or arrangement with God uh, and receives God's permission 
to go ahead and tempt in, or attempt to tempt and mislead uh, God's cre creatures. Uh, so, but in any case, he's not a polytheist, but he is one of the kafirun. So, yeah. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but that shows you that kafirun cannot be limited to a definition just just a polytheist. There must be something else in. Well, that's right. Uh, I, I, again, uh, I argue that uh, there's a polysemy at work with with this verb kafara mm -hmm. and with the noun uh, because of ingratitude. Kind of, because kuf can also refer to ingratitude, or it, it has uh, it has connotations of ingratitude, which of course shows up in the Aramaic cognate, uh, and it also has uh, uh, connotations of covering things up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you you so, cover that in depth. Yeah, the of course, ingratitude is, it is in a way covering up the, 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 the favor that was done to you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, um, uh, right. So, but what I'm arguing is that that, that as the word is used in, in, in the Quran, the plural al kafirun uh, refers to pagans. Uh, right. And right. it's never used uh, too core to refer to uh, Jews or Christians. So that, yeah, that I wanted to get to that before we move on to uh, the other article here on uh, Quranic punishments for adultery. But uh, the Quran, as you note, and you, for, for anyone who hasn't read the article, uh, uh, this is not, um, this is not just, you know, someone making arguments without backing them up. I mean, it's really in-depth discussion, uh, engaging with Islamic tradition and late antique texts in various languages, including Latin and Greek. Uh, and uh, you don't really miss, you, you anticipate possible counter arguments. So one of them is, wait a second, uh, the Quran does use this phrase, um, kafira, in regard to things which Christians say, or things that are close to things Christians say. So classically, in Surah Al-Ma'i, the Quran 5, verse 72, uh, the Quran says, "Those who have said God is Christ, the Son of Mary, have kafara." Uh, so, how do you work that out? How how are they not min kafirun? Oh, sorry, min kafirin, but uh, they did kafara. Well, because the noun and the verb are are, are distinct, uh, and um, there's uh, the the linguists say that when a noun migrates a bit away from the verb that's a form of idiosyncratic polysemy mm -hmm. uh, and so um i think you know words have contexts uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the verb isn't exactly like the noun mm -hmm. whereas al kafirun i think always is used in the quran to refer to a concrete sociological view okay the okay. verb is is much more elastic and has wide uh, wide wide implications, uh, and also the verbal noun kufr is like that. So I just say that you know there's a verse in uh, um, in the Quran which traditionally has been thought to be talked talking about the Battle of Uhud, the second major battle fought with the Meccans, uh, in which uh, there were some Muslims who didn't go out to fight, they stayed in Medina. And uh, they apologized to the prophet. They said, well, if we had known how to fight, we would have fought. We we're civilians, we don't even know how to do that. So we were all civilians, you know, it was not a, not a good excuse. And the Quran says, on that day, they were closer to Kufr than to Iman. They were closer and to belief, yes, to whatever kufr is than, than to belief. Mm -hmm. uh, these are Muslims, yes, yes, okay. So, and I, I compare it to, to a word like uh, sin and sinner. Like, if, if, you, if somebody was a preacher from a monotheistic community, they would say, Well, uh, our congregation are the faithful. And those people who are outsiders and don't accept uh, salvation from our source are sinners, right? But that isn't to say that somebody in the congregation hasn't hooked up with somebody else's wife and so are committing a sin. Uh, the, the faithful can commit sins as well, but they don't belong to the sociological category mm -hmm. 
of the non-believers or sinners. So I think the verb kafara is like that. Uh, it's something that a Benotheist can do. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they can just go in the wrong direction, right. uh, and including right. Muslims. Right. So right. It, it's not a sociological category. It's right. an action. Right. So right. I think that's because al has, really yes. has undergone this evolution towards yes. a, a, a idiosyncratic polysemy that it, it has come to mean a group of pagans. <laughs> so in the same way, you know, uh, uh, there's a, a, a group uh, that are called al adina Kafirum and Ahl Kitab, the, the people who have committed kufr from among the people of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I argue that that under, underpins my point. Right, because it shows uh, only some of them have done the, the kafir. Others if, have if, not. If they were all Kafirun, then you wouldn't need to make this distinction. Uh, yes. So yeah, only yes. some of them. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so, um, and, and I also suspect uh, that if you look at where this this kind of diction occurs in the Quran, that it's a political category and not a theological one. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, I think these are Jews and who knows, possibly Christians or, or Sabians or, or, or whatever, who is monothe monotheists who, mm -hmm. uh, who who threw in with the Meccan pagans right. rather than right. supporting uh, Muhammad. Yes. Uh, and so I don't think it's about the release. Now, the particular verse that you brought up about uh, it, it being kufr to say that uh, God is Jesus, uh, that would be kufr in Christianity, too. Yes. Yes, it would. That's a good point. <laughs> it is theologically heterodox. Yeah. The other way around, a Christian might say, uh, probably would say that Christ is God, but not that God is Christ, uh, because that's yeah, more complicated than that. <laughs> well, is it okay for us to move on to the third article? And sure. uh, we're still dealing with late antiquity, so uh, I'm counting this as a, uh, a smooth and elegant segue. So we're continuing to speak about late antiquity, but now instead of uh, Kefera, we're speaking about the question of, well, the, the title of your article speaks of adultery, but in fact, you speak about more than that. You, you speak about both the, what are commonly known as adultery uh, and fornication, um, so all sorts of uh, sexual uh, deviancy. Um, the title of the article is Late Roman Law and the Quranic Punishment for Adultery, which is published recently in the Muslim world. Uh, and I mean, the title sort of gets at the main argument that, in fact, late Roman law, Byzantine uh, law, is critical to understanding the various verses. And there's not just one or two. You bring together a lot of evidence that deal with uh, Quranic prescriptions for uh, punishment of um, either, and maybe we should start with these terms, fahisha, the Arabic word fahisha, and the Arabic word zina. Uh, so um, yeah, there's some, I think there's some foundational work to do to fully communicate your argument. Maybe that's the, the first point. Uh, the, what does the Quran mean by fahisha? What does the Quran mean, mean by zina? Um, how are they usually understood, and what is your particular take on those two words? Yeah. Well, the, the uh, fahisha has has you know been interpreted by the uh, Quran commentators as, as sexual impropriety, basically. I think you could say, uh, and um, uh, it's been suggested that it's it's a maybe a, a loan shift of, of the Greek pornia, pornia, uh, right. uh, which also has these wide connotations. Mm -hmm. Whereas Zina has. Uh, uh, Zina has has tended to be um, interpreted as as uh, adultery per se. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so sure about these distinctions mm -hmm. myself. And and um, if you look at their cognates uh, in other Semitic languages, that distinction doesn't isn't so clear, at least in the Hebrew. The Hebrew is and, uh, zone, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, it has. It, has, it, it it also would be pornea, right? It would be mm -hmm. a, a wide range of, of, of uh, illicit activities, not just adultery. So, um, but my my overall uh, starting point here is that the later Muslim tradition, and starting apparently from the eighth century, uh, describes stoning uh, right. as a punishment for adultery. Yes. And it's not mentioned in the Quran. Right. And, and in the, in unless, the Quran, unless you, sorry, but I have to <laughs> jump in to say, unless you 
follow the tradition of ayat al uh, but it's actually not not in the text of the Quran that the tradition has read or that we have today. But there are these other stories about a verse being removed. Yes, uh, by Omar and, and so forth. But uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, these early Quran manuscripts we're finding are making this less and less plausible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, um, I don't think it's in the Quran, uh, right. and uh, and moreover, not only is doing that in the Quran, but the, the adultery in the Quran is not a capital crime. Mm -hmm. It's even something that you can be forgiven for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, specifically uh, Quran uh, four sixteen, I think, Anisa sixteen, which you you discuss there, which uh, uh, says Father uh, du anhuma, and there's probably a lot of work to do to explain because there it's in the dual, but uh, that's understood as you explain as turn away from them, maybe, which would imply um, perhaps for those who are penitent, for those who repent, complete forgiveness of the crime. Yeah, well, I think that's implied. Uh, and um, so, and then in the Quran itself, not only is stoning not mentioned, but then there are various punishments mentioned for some kind of sexual mm -hmm. pride. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of them is for the woman to be immured uh, in, mm -hmm. in a house. So Kept could, in her in house, her yes. House rest. Um, and to, I mean, permanently, right? And doesn't the verse explicitly say until death? Well, no, it, it, there's an escape hatch. It says, or okay. until God changes your condition or something. Okay, um, okay. Uh, and then, uh, as you say, there, there's uh, stripes are are, uh, uh, are dictated for uh, in, in in some verses as whipping corporal mm -hmm. punishment, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, what struck me is that uh, I, when I first began working on on the Quran uh, uh, in a serious way. 15 years ago, uh, I I went to the Roman laws and I was interested, you know, is there a, a Roman background to it? And uh, there's a, a novel of Justinian, uh, which has a, a subsection on adultery uh, that I interpret as prescribing for the woman uh, corporal punishment first and then immurement. And in, in Justinian's case, he uh, dictated that that she should go to a nun nunnery, to a convent or nunnery. Yes. Can can we pause there just to to explain for viewers a little bit uh, about Justinian and his novel? Because this may be, I mean, as you note at the opening of of the article, uh, a lot of modern scholarship on Islamic law and jurisprudence. Uh, takes for granted that the closer connection with Islamic law is Jewish law. Uh, and so this is uh, this is really an innovative argument you're making to connect Islamic law. And it's not only here, there's another article that I'll hopefully speak about in a, in a subsequent episode uh, with the novel of Justinian. So Justinian is a Byzantine emperor uh, or Eastern Roman emperor. Maybe maybe I'm using those terms inappropriately because I'm not really sure when people start using the term Byzantine, uh, who reigns from 527 to 565. I'll just tell you, tell you the few things that I've heard. You can correct me or add more. And uh, I mean, at once uh, leads a massive uh, reconquest of formerly Roman territories, including in North Africa and I think Italy itself. Uh, and so for a moment, for one fleeting moment, sort of restores the glory of the Roman Empire, uh, also establishes this law code, but I think also bankrupts the empire more or less and uh, sets up the subsequent loss of territory by his successors. Uh, something more we should add about him or his law code? Well, that's about it. Uh, there's, by the way, a brand new biography of Justinian by the great uh, scholar Peter Saras has just come out. Okay. Uh, I recommend everybody who's interested in late antiquity to to read it. Um, and Sarah's also uh, was was involved in translating the novels of Justinian. So they're now by novels. Just to be clear, in case anyone's mistaken, we don't mean like Harry Potter, 
<laughs> novels. I don't know why they have that term, but we, we mean a, a law code, right? They, they, they were new decrees. They mm -hmm. just come from, so from the word yeah. new, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's right. In, in late antiquity, the word novel does not refer to a, a fiction, it, it refers to these, these law decrees. And so um, I just find that the combination of, 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 of punishments that are mentioned in the Quran for adultery uh, are, are more similar to Justinian's law code than they are, and to, to, to previous Roman custom, uh, than they are to, uh, to Judaic law. Uh, I think there's lots of instances of influence of Judaism on Islam. I don't, I'm not taking that position. I'm just saying that in the particular instance of adultery, mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that um, there's there's almost an exact correlation because the woman is immured. So that's also in, in, in Justinian uh, or corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. That's also in Justinian. And I think it was before Justinian as well, whipping. And, and you find it in, in, in um, Roman successor states in Spain and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Looking for adultery. The visit uh, of your, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so for some can, reason, can we speak? Sorry, Professor Cole, I keep jumping in, but I just I, I feel like the the parallel or the bit about immurement or uh, confinement uh, is really intriguing. Uh, could you explain a little bit uh, how you present the Justinian uh, prescription for punishment? of a woman guilty of, I guess, porneia, any sort of, I think I think it might be specifically adultery. It's for a married woman, it's, I think, right? It's specifically, it's married women. Because in the ancient world, I'm sorry to say this, but they, they don't punish the men uh, for stepping out, for the most part. Uh, they, they punish the, the, the women. And they only punish the men if they step out with a married woman. So it's an injury against her husband. Against her husband, okay. Uh, so. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, uh, so a woman who is uh, has been found guilty of adultery uh, would be uh, uh, corporally punished. Uh, she'd be fined uh, as well, uh, and then she would be in Justinian's uh, uh, novel. She she she's sent to a nunnery she for, has for two years, I think. You, two is years, that right? yes. And her husband can take her back at any time in the two years. Okay. If he if he chooses not to. Then she undergoes the tonsure and she becomes a nun for the rest of her life. Okay. And, and that, uh, you know, it's been argued by people who study the Eastern Roman Christians that uh, this is actually a form of of uh, mercy. That instead of the old, so, some of the old Roman laws prescribed capital punishment as well, uh, but now the soul is being given a chance, right? Yes. And can repent. Yes. Uh, and uh, you can maybe make a better life for yourself and, and so forth. And even just the promulgation of such rules was seen as edu educative for the souls mm -hmm. of, the, of the Christians. And, and I would say, I mean, th there's such a gap historically, culturally, from the late antique world to 2023 uh, in the U.S. But, uh, I mean, uh, in a deeply religious culture, there is a certain coherence to that. Uh, that this is a merciful option. Um, but in addition, I mean, I imagine there's some cases where a woman is es escaping a, uh, a an abusive relationship and probably wanted to stay in the convent and was hoping her husband wouldn't show up and take her back. Uh, but, well, that's an interesting insight, yeah. <laughs> but probably, uh, I mean, the, the two years uh, is meant to give, as you were saying yourself in the article, meant to give the husband uh, you know, instead of some capital punishment being carried out on the supposedly adulterous wife, uh, a chance to soften his heart and and forgive her. And, uh, yeah. The interesting thing is that there's also a, a law that if a husband slanders his wife, accuses her of adultery mm -hmm. falsely, yes, then he gets punished the way she would have got punished. Okay. Uh, okay. And there is actually a passage in the secret history of, of, of Justinian by one of his courtiers, which talks about this happening to some men uh, who accused their wives of adultery, uh, but the wives were very well connected with the palace. And they they exonerated the themselves. They, they turned the tables on their husbands. Yeah. And so the husbands were whipped, and then they were put in jail. Okay. 
Okay. So well, that, I, there's, that, this comes up in the Quran as well, as you outlined. There's a concern uh, not only for uh, for uh, for fahisha and zina, so sexual impropriety, but also for false false accusation. That's right. Uh, and uh, so, just the, the the kind of Quranic milieu, the kinds of uh, punishments that are talked about, the the attitudes towards these issues. And the, it seems to me, you know, an implication of a possibility of forgiveness. All of this is late antique Christianity, uh, and it's it's distinctly not what's in the Palestinian Talmud. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it just seems to me that's where we should look for the background of, of this particular complex of laws. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get at least to get in two more questions at least before we wrap up. Um, I, I wanted to speak more generally, maybe I should have started here, but nevertheless, uh, ha happily, it's not too late to ask a question, which is, um, I mean, from the perspective of the Quran, or for what it's worth, late antique Christianity, Justinian, or otherwise, what's the problem with uh, people having sex, not with their husband or wife like what ultimately is the problem is it a purely religious problem or there social social dimensions imagined that are problematic about it as well oh well i think from an anthropological point of view it's very clear that um uh that it, it just causes a lot of trouble in society mm -hmm. uh, in the modern times before there was birth control you don't know whose kid is whose who's, who's responsible for them mm -hmm. and paying for a child is, is a lot of money, uh, and uh, Kanye West has complained about gold diggers in that regard. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then there would be fights between the men, and uh, and then I think in the Quran, there's a, there's an interesting verse which is very poignant and tender about the relationship between husband and wife, mm -hmm. and, and talks about how. Uh, they shouldn't defile the devotion of one another to you know in this way uh and um i think there's a a subjective uh, interior uh, sense in which one's relationship with one's spouse can be ruined in this way and that, that the quran is concerned about you know the soul and the progress of the soul and and the relationships that make for uh, the, the, the soul's uh, uh, ethical action in the world. Uh, so that's that shouldn't be ignored. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, you know, it, again, it's not it's not about sex with other people though, because in the Quran you can have more than one wife. Mm -hmm. You can have sex with a slave girl with a concubine. Uh, it's it's a violation of the rules mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. governing those those sexual relations. Uh, and and it, and of course, ultimately is is an injury towards people. It's a tort. Uh, mm. So um, there is a dimension of say uh, the right the right of the husband uh, that a woman has violated, which uh, is not a. I mean, we we tend to conceive of rights in maybe a more limited way, but here it's the injury to one's status, one's honor, one's position. Yes, but uh, interestingly enough, in the Quran. The sexes are treated are treated pretty equally hmm. in this regard. So the the, the the husband would also be punished uh, for adultery. Right. Uh, you, I mean, you you highlight Quran uh, twenty four sort of the north verses two and three, which uh, prescribe the exact uh, same punishment to the zania and the zani. Uh, I mean, to uh, the adulteress or fornicatress. And the adulterer or fornicator, um, which is the the lashing, the hundred hundred lashes. Uh, so yeah. there, there's strict equality. And and that's not. I mean, it's harsh. I mean, let's not let's not make yeah, it into with no, hundred lashes. But there's, yeah. it's equal. It's not uh, worse for the woman. And I don't think uh, I can't think of another uh, legal code in in that period in, in late antiquity uh, where the two sexes are treated equally in the law that way. It wasn't exactly the same way in, in, in the Roman Empire. Interesting. Well, one last question to get in here on this uh, this article in the Muslim world, namely that you argue that in certain, you can read certain verses of the Quran and deduce that the particular offense the Quran is worried about 
uh, when it speaks of fahisha, I think in particular, but correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, what you call public or repeated behavior. Um, so you, you you say more, if I'm understanding correctly, you say, well, when you read through the lines of what the Quran is saying, uh, there's almost some license allowed for um, personal behavior if it doesn't become a threat to sort of uh, order or the community um, by being public or or, or repeated. Yes, and, and that actually seems to me to be uh, uh, similar to some of the rabbis' prescriptions. Okay. okay. Uh, that you know, if you, if a man finds his wife has stepped out on him, first thing he should do is sit down and have a talk with her. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first thing isn't to punish her uh, and see if you can't reconcile and find out what's wrong. And so forth. And the Quran implies that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, it's only if the behavior is like repeated and public and and, uh, and incorrigible that the woman is punished. And I wonder whether the woman who's being uh, immured in, in the house isn't such a woman, maybe a prostitute or someone guilty of repeated and public infractions, okay. because that verse doesn't uh, mention anything about punishing the man. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it, it, it seems to be something peculiar to the behavior of the woman. Or possibly she has had an affair with Pagan. Uh, uh, so Pagan mm -hmm. would not be under the Quranic law. But there, I, there's I've heard, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll restrain myself this time, please. Can, can no, see. no, please. Uh, I'm, I'm done. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I've heard Muslim friends make the argument in regard to the prescriptions of Islamic law that, I mean, ultimately, Islamic law has a social concern. and so um, deviance is allowed is basically if you keep it to yourself. Uh, but what the 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 problem is uh, the destabilization of society that takes place when you're public about it, or when to when you seek to uh, invite others to your deviant behavior or deviant beliefs. Um, so I, I don't think that's entirely consistent with with fiqh with Islamic jurisprudence. Um, but in fact, maybe there's something in the Quran that is a similar flavor or vibe uh, as to that. As I as I said before, I think the main thing the Quran is interested in and is similar to what the contemporary Christians and Jews were interested in, which was mm -hmm. the welfare of the soul. Mm -hmm. Of the soul. And so all of, of the soul, mm. uh, and okay. uh, for Christians in particular, the possibility of salvation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what does it matter you your body suffers if, if your soul can live forever uh, and you get salvation? So I think there's something in the Quran of that as well, that, that the, the care of the soul is 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 behind these laws. And that's why I'm very interested that it's it's not capital punishment that is mentioned. Uh, so the goal is reform. The goal is reform, reform is and reform. not uh, vengeance. or Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for Patricia Krohn, one of her proof texts that the later Muslim tradition of the later Umayyads and the Abbasids, which is the first one we get written down in prose, uh, has departed from the milieu of the Quran, was this, mm -hmm. that, that stoning became universally accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas it's not in the Quran. And, and she thinks this is a, one of a number of signs that there was this evolution away from the early Quranic milieu, uh, and that therefore, you know, some of these later sources are not very trustworthy if you're a historian. And I think that's right. Um, and I, I think uh, we need to do some excavation work to understand what was the Quran about, uh, as opposed to what is Islam uh, written large about, or, or the later Islamic tradition. By the way, the Kharijites did not accept uh, uh, stoning. Uh, and uh, there's uh, Ibn Kathir mentions that in the medieval period uh, in Libya, the Berbers uh, it didn't stone for adultery because they were uh, Abadites as her yes, very intriguing. Very so intriguing. there was this one uh, schism uh, in, in Islamic thought about this yes. issue. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Cole. Before we say goodbye, uh, how, how do people stay in touch with your work? And do you want to mention any? New projects, current projects that you're uh, that you're working on. 
Well, I, I have submitted the manuscript for a book about the Quran uh, uh, to the uh, series of the International Quran Studies Association, uh, which is now being published by De Breuter in Berlin. Uh, and uh, so it's just been submitted. So it'll be a while before it appears, uh, uh, if in fact it gets through refereeing. Uh, but uh, my journal articles I put, as you say, up at academia.edu, where I have a, a, an account. Uh, and um, I often will also share them on my social media. Uh, I'm on, uh, on X, on Blue Sky, on, uh, uh, on uh, Facebook, and so forth. And usually my handle is J R I C O L E. Uh, and uh, so, um, and then I continue to write for a general audience about Muslim issues uh, at my blog. And I, I put out an essay uh, last week on the ways in which Hamas's horrific attack in Israel violated uh, the precepts of the Quran. Thank you. We'll we'll link to uh, to some of those uh, sites and social media in the uh, in the description. And it's really been a pleasure. I, I would look forward to if I can convince you a second session because we did not exhaust your recent publications on the Quran, there's more to speak about, including uh, more Justinian, something about the word Islam itself. And uh, I look forward to speaking about that. But for now, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for having me, Gabriel. I'm always glad to be on. It's, it's a great program, a great service that you do. Thank you.